Christ's compassion and how it should impact us. Obviously, Jesus Christ showed compassion when he was here on this earth. That was one of the character traits that he expressed while he was here. And how should that impact us as followers of Jesus Christ? You know, the Bible clearly teaches us that we are to walk in his steps. You know, we even sang out of the hymnal this morning that very thing, that we're supposed to follow in his steps, follow in his way. And that really is the command, and that really is the job of a Christian, is to follow in the way of Jesus Christ. And let me give you a, a quick warning on this. We're not to follow in the way of the Jesus Christ that Hollywood has made up. Do you guys understand that? We're supposed to follow in the way the, of the Jesus Christ that the Bible describes who he is. Who is the Jesus of the Bible? I don't care who the Jesus of Hollywood is. I don't care who the Jesus of you know, popular opinion is. I care who the Bible or who the Jesus of the Bible is. And that's the one who we need to follow. And what are those character traits? He has many character traits among him, but one of those that stands out in his earthly ministry while he was here was compassion. That compassion ought to be a contagious compassion which compels the followers of Jesus Christ to act as he did and express that compassion in the same manner. Take your Bibles and go to Matthew chapter 9 this morning. Matthew chapter 9 is a good place for us to start off. How many are with me this morning? Matthew chapter 9, and I want you to look at verse number 36 with me. Matthew chapter 9, and we're going to start here in verse number 36, and we're going to read to verse number 38. Now follow along with me in your Bibles, and then we'll open up with a word of prayer. But when he saw the multitude, he was moved with compassion on them, because they fainted and were scattered abroad as sheep having no shepherd. And then he said unto his disciples, The harvest truly is plenteous, but the laborers are few. Look at verse 38. Pray therefore the Lord of the harvest that he will send forth laborers into this harvest. I want you to realize that Jesus Christ looked out amongst a group of people who had not eaten in days. They had been walking for days following him. And because they were scattered and because they were his creation, he looks out at them and the first response is compassion. And we're going to talk about this in a little bit, but I'm sure that there were some sinners among that crowd. Wouldn't you think so? I'm sure that amongst that crowd, there were some pretty rotten people who were maybe trying to get their life right. I'm sure there were some adulterers in there. I'm sure there were some fornicators in there. I'm sure there were some of all types and all stripes in that crowd. But i got to tell you this morning, Jesus Christ did not look out at that crowd and first see their sin. He looked out at that crowd and first saw their need. And their need was that they needed a Savior. And the reaction that he had to that was that he did not show anger, he did not show wrath, but he showed compassion. Now understand me this morning, I'm not going soft. The God of the Bible is a God of judgment. He is a God of wrath. He is a God of righteousness. Don't get me wrong. Those are certainly aspects of God. But let me tell you this morning, you and I are not called to follow in the footsteps of God the Father. You and I are called to follow in the footsteps of Jesus Christ. Are you with me? And when Jesus Christ was here on this earthly ministry, he looked out at this crowd of people of all backgrounds who struggled with all kinds of different things, probably much like this crowd here, all of us. And he saw sin, yes, but he didn't respond with anger and wrath and brimstone and fire from hell. He responded with compassion. And I believe that we are supposed to follow in his footsteps. Therefore, that compassion that he showed that crowd ought to be contagious. Amen? It ought to be contagious. It means it's communicable. It means it spreads to the next person and to the next person and to the next person. We as Christians should show compassion. If we are not going to show compassion, then tell me who is. If we as followers of Jesus Christ are not going to show compassion, then tell me who is going to show compassion. There's an illustration that I like to tell you, and it's about a man who falls into a pit. I don't know, you may have heard this illustration before, but the uh, interesting, because as uh, he was laying in the pit, and there he was, stuck, and he couldn't get out. 
there were several people who, who walked by and saw him in that pit. And, you know, uh, the Pharisees first walked by and said, uh, you know, bad people fall into the pit. The Pharisee walked by and looked down at the man in the pit, and he says, you know, it's only bad people who fall into the pit, right? It didn't help the man, did it? Didn't help the man at all. You know, a Christian uh, scientist came along and looked at him in the pit, and he said, uh, you know, you only think you're in the pit, right? That didn't help him much, did it? He was still in the pit. Not only that, but the fundamentalist walked by and said, you deserve to be in the pit. It didn't help him, did it? Not at all. It didn't help him at all. The charismatic walked by and said, hey, just confess that you're not in the pit. Right? Still didn't help him. The man was still in the pit. A Baptist came by and gave him a hot dish. <laughs> didn't help him much. He was still in the pit, wasn't he? <laughs> right? Okay? Presbyterian a Calvinist came by and said, you know, that was no accident that you fell in the pit, right? That's a theological one. The theological uh, thinkers out there got that one, right? An optimist came by and said, hey, could be worse, right? Could be worse. Pessimist came by and said, you know, things will probably get worse. You know, all of those people walked by, and I'll tell you what, that's probably a pretty accurate representation of most of Christianity today. But you know what happens is, we can give them all of the advice in the world, but they still don't get out of the pit. But Jesus Christ walked by that pit. And you know what he did? He got on his knees and he reached his hand down, took the man's hand, and pulled him out of the pit. See, that's compassion. Compassion is seeing somebody's situation and being inwardly driven to do something about it. That's what compassion is. Right? See, and it's compassion that makes the difference. Right? It's not religion that makes the difference. It's not good observation that makes the difference. It's not a good explanation. Well, you know, you deserve to be in the pit. Right? Those kinds of things don't help people out of the pit. It's only compassion. And when we're driven by compassion, the compassion that Jesus Christ showed us, that we're willing and able to get out of the pit at that point. Amen? Three questions about this that I want to answer today from the Word of God is, number one, where did His compassion come from? Where did the compassion of Jesus Christ come from? You still with me this morning? Number two question that I'd like to ask and answer is, where is His compassion focused? Okay? And then number three, and lastly, I'd like to answer, why is His compassion expressed? So let's start with this today. Where did His compassion come from? Write that down if you're taking notes. You ask that question to yourself. Where did His compassion come from? Let's answer that in twofold uh, answer today. Number one, His essence. I want you to go to John chapter 14, and I want you to look at verse number 9. John chapter 14, and look at verse number 9 with me. We see the character of Jesus Christ in this and who Jesus Christ was. Look at, he says in John chapter 14 and verse number 9. He says, And Jesus said unto him, Have I been so long time with you, and yet hast thou not known me? You know, sometimes I hear him often whisper those same words to me. Amen when I misjudge the character of Christ, or when I don't express the character of Christ in my own life, I can almost hear Jesus Christ say to me, have you been so long time with me and still you don't know me? He that hath seen me hath seen the Father. And how sayest then, uh, thou then show us the Father? Jesus Christ was saying in this simple verse, in these simple words, that if you have seen me, you have seen the Father. If you've seen me express my character, then you have seen the character of the Father. What am I trying to say in all of this? I'm trying to say this, that so often we look at the God of the Old Testament, and in our minds we think, that he is just waiting with a baseball bat to club us over the head at the first opportunity. 
that we think that He is angry with us. We think that He wants to punish us, that He's waiting to trip us up, and He's laid out all of these laws and rules and regulations just to make us fall so that when we do, He can get the, 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 the desire and He can get the, the, the satisfaction of, of clubbing us and punishing us and chastening us. Let me tell you this, that nothing could be further from the truth. Even in the Old Testament, we see the compassion of God, the grace and the mercy of God. Amen. And we also see that in the character of Jesus Christ. And Jesus Christ, who was the most compassionate ever, says, you've seen me, you've seen the Father. The character that we see in Jesus Christ while He walked on this earth and He healed the blind and He made the sick well and He caused the lame to walk. That same God, Jesus Christ, is the God of the Old Testament. Amen. Please do not get into this mindset that God is just waiting to club you. He's waiting to show you compassion. Amen? Amen. He's waiting to show you compassion. What is compassion again? It's seeing somebody in need and having an inward desire to do something about it. Let me tell you, Jesus Christ, God, saw the greatest need that ever was. It was not a need of hunger, or a need of water, or a need of shelter, or a need of clothing. It was a spiritual need. Amen? A spiritual need in which God the Father looked down upon His creation and saw that you and I were all sinners, every one of us. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. All ground is level at the cross. There is not one person in here who has not sinned. And if somebody in here says that they have not sinned, the Bible says that they're a liar. Amen? He saw our need, and our need was a spiritual one. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. He said, I love my creation. I love what I've created. I love that man. I love that woman. I love them. And they've found themselves in a bad way. And me being a God of compassion sees that need that they have. And I'm going to do something about it. And you know what God the Father did? God the Father sent His only begotten Son to die on a cross for your sins and for my sins. That's what He did. Being inwardly driven to do something about the need. That's what God did. Amen. We learn in the book of Acts that it says that God shed His own blood for you and for me. The blood that was shed on the cross of Calvary wasn't just any blood. It was divine blood. It was God's blood. The Bible says, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. The price that you and I have to pay for our sin is eternal death. But think about what Christ did. Came to the cross. What did He do on the cross? Did He live on the cross? No. He died on the cross. Why? Because the wages of sin is death. He paid your price. The wages that you were supposed to pay, He paid it on the cross of Calvary. Now that's compassion. From the God who's the God, same God in the Old Testament, same God in the New Testament, that is compassion. He's the same God yesterday, today, and forever. You see, when we see the compassion and the character of Jesus Christ, why did He show this compassion? And where did it come from? It came from the essence of who Jesus Christ was because He was God. And He says to these unbelieving disciples and these unbelieving Pharisees, if you see Me, you see the Father. Amen. His essence. Where did His compassion come from? Also His experience. His experience. Go to Hebrews chapter 4 and verse number 15 with me. Hebrews chapter 4. This is one of the things that sets Jesus Christ apart from any other God. But let me say that again. This is one of the things that sets our God apart from any other God. You with me? 
Hebrews chapter 4 and look at verse number 15. Hebrews chapter 4 and verse number 15. This is what it is. He says this, Seeing then that we have a great high priest. How many can say amen to that? Amen. That we have a great high priest. A high priest was somebody who was supposed to go before God on behalf of the people. An advocate, right? An advocate. Like an attorney. Stands before a judge on behalf of their clients. The high priest stood before God, the ultimate judge, on behalf of the people. Jesus Christ is our advocate. Amen? Amen. The high priest. But look at what he says. That is passed into the heavens. Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our profession. For we have not an high priest which cannot be touched with the feelings of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted it like as we are, yet without sin. Let me tell you that Jesus Christ came to this earth. And yes, His compassion came from the essence of who He was. But His compassion also came from what He experienced on this earth. The Bible just told you and I that Jesus Christ, while He was here, this high priest came to a lowly state and became like as we are. Amen? And He was tempted in all points as we are, yet without sin. You think, oh boy, God doesn't know what I'm going through. God knows exactly what you're going through. Amen. You're tempted, He was tempted. Amen? You and I are tempted in all kinds of different ways. Jesus Christ was tempted in the same ways Amen. while He was here walking on this earth. There is nothing that you're tempted with, nothing that you struggle with, that Jesus Christ did not experience in His ministry here on this earth. You tell me what other God became like His own people and experienced what they experienced so that He could experience and show compassion. Compassion not from a lofty estate, but compassion from a lowly estate, eye level with you and I. Amen. That's where his compassion comes from, his experience. But jump over to chapter 2 and look at verse number 18. For in that he himself hath suffered being tempted, he is able to succor them that are tempted. Do you see that? What does that word sucker mean? That word sucker means to comfort. Because he was tempted like we are, the Bible saying in Hebrews chapter 2 and verse number 18, he's therefore able to come alongside of us and to comfort us in our temptation because he says, yeah, I've been there. Amen? What other God has been there? Buddha been there? Has Allah been there? There's no other God that's been there. Only the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, only the God of Jesus Christ, amen, amen, has been where you and I have been, suffering the same temptations, suffering the same trials, the same tribulations. There is nothing that you are going through that Jesus Christ did not experience here on this earth. How do I know that? Because it says, in all points tempted as we are yet without sin. He knows. This is not some distant God who's disconnected from His creation. This is a God that cared so much in the essence of who He was that He expressed that compassion. And in expressing that compassion, He also experienced that compassion and is now able to pass that along to us. Amen? You ought to praise the Lord that we serve a God whose compassion was experienced. And the reason that He gives us His compassion and where His compassion comes from is because He experienced it Himself. You go through and you look at what Christ experienced and you begin to realize as you study the Gospels, He really did go through some of the very same things that we went go through. 
Do you ever feel alone? Do you ever feel alone? Well, I'll tell you what, I feel alone. Amen? You say, how in the world could you, Pastor Brad Brandon, feel alone? You're a pastor. You're a radio talk show host. Everybody loves you. Not everybody. But I feel alone. And you know what happens when I feel alone? I think to Jesus Christ, who at one point in his ministry had everybody at his disposal. Everybody following, Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest. The multitudes were thronging after him. Amen? Amen. But then there came a point in time when everybody left him. You know, even Paul says, everybody's left me. But Luke, everybody's gone. I wonder how many times Paul looked at the example of Jesus Christ and said, you know what, my God knows what it's like to be alone. My, know, my God knows what it's like to have everybody turn their back on him. He knows. He knows. Right? That's the difference between our God and every other God. Amen. Our God's been there. Amen? Our God has been there. Let's answer the next question. Where is his compassion focused? Are you ready for this? Where is his compassion focused in all of this? Well, let's take it piece by piece. You look at the study or do a brief study of the Gospels, and it reveals that his compassion knew absolutely no boundaries. Amen? Amen. Boy, I am sure glad that there is nothing that I can do in the whole world that would make God and Christ turn off His compassion for me. Amen? Amen. Turn off His nothing I can do that will make God turn off His compassion for me. Where was His compassion focused when He was here on earth? How about the scattered? Look at Matthew chapter 9 with me, and let's look at these as we go through. Matthew chapter 9. As we look at Matthew chapter 9, we see that Jesus Christ's compassion was even shown toward the scattered, as we see here in verse number 36. But when He saw the multitude, He was moved with compassion on them. Why? Because they fainted, they were scattered abroad, as sheep having no shepherd. What happens to a sheep that has no shepherd? It's lost, right? It doesn't know its way. It's wandering around, going nowhere. Amen? You know, you look at people and you see people like that today who are lost. They're wandering around. They're going nowhere. They're a sheep without shepherd. And you know what oftentimes we do? Well, we're like the good fundamentalist who walks by and says, well, that's, that's what that kind of lifestyle will do for you. Right? Well, you know, that's what happens when you live in sin. Well, look, that may be true. Having fundamentalists become the experts at proclaiming the obvious. But compassion doesn't drive us to comp- uh, proclaim the obvious. Compassion drives us to what? Action. Like Christ who got on his knees and reached down in the pit and helped the guy out. He didn't just say, well, you know, things could be worse. Well, things are probably going to get worse. Right? Why don't we look at people who are scattered? They're lost. They don't know where they're going. They have no shepherd. Why don't we look at them with compassion as Jesus Christ did? Jesus Christ realized that their problem was not that they were lost. Their problem was that they had no shepherd. Amen? Because let's face it, you can be found, but if you're found by the wrong person, well, it doesn't do you much good, does it? What if you're found by somebody who's lost themselves? Well, you both fall in a ditch. 
He had to be found by the shepherd. Jesus Christ recognized that problem. There are lost people who are scattered, who have no shepherd. They've lost their way, and they don't know where they're going. Right? What's your reaction to them? Well, they're just dumb. Well, they just hate God. Well, I'll tell you what, there's probably a time in my life when I hated God. I'm sure glad somebody had compassion on me. I'm sure, glad so, I'm, I'm sure glad that somebody caught the compassion that Jesus Christ gave them and then expressed that compassion to me. Even the scattered need compassion. Amen? How about the sick? Matthew chapter 20, how about the sick? Jesus Christ showed compassion on the sick, did he not? Look at verse number 30, Matthew chapter 20 and verse number 30. And behold, two blind men sitting by the wayside, when they heard that Jesus passed by, cried out, saying, Have mercy on us, O Lord, thou son of David. Listen, if you were blind, in an age when they didn't have Braille and seeing eye dogs and government assistance, in a day and age when if you were blind, look, the best you could do is sit by the wayside. That's what your day consisted of. And you heard that a man was coming who had healed blind people before. Oh, let me tell you, nothing would stop you from crying out. Amen. Right? Amen. Nothing would stop you from crying out. 31, and the multitude rebuked them because they should hold their peace, but they cried the more, saying, Have mercy on us, O Lord, thou son of David. And Jesus stood still and called them and said, What will ye that I shall do unto you? What kind of God does that? What kind of God says that? He walks by the wayside. He's the creator of the universe. By his assist. The Word of God says. The sun rises and the sun's because He said so that day. And He sees two poor blind men who've got a hope in the world. And what does He say to them? What can I do for you? That's what He's saying. What can I do for you? That's compassion. Amen. That is compassion. Amen. I don't know of any other God who came to this earth to serve other people. Every other God that I know of came to be served. Here Jesus sees them and says, what can I do for you? What will ye that I shall do unto you? And they said to him, Lord, that our eyes may be opened. So Jesus had compassion on them and touched their eyes, and immediately their eyes received sight, and they followed him. See, when somebody experiences the compassion of Jesus Christ, they become followers of him. Amen? Amen. And it doesn't matter whether they see that compassion directly from Christ or if they see the compassion of Christ through you. Amen. They become followers of Him, right? Not only does He have compassion on the scattered and the sick, but He has compassion on the suffering. Look at Luke chapter 7. Luke chapter 7, and look at verse number 11. And it came to pass the day after that he went into a city called Nain. And many of his disciples went with him and much people. Here's Mr. Popular now. It isn't always that way, right? But you know, I, I can really relate to that. You know why? Because everybody loves you when you're hitting home runs. 
But when the home runs dry up, you find out who your real friends are, don't you? And when he came nigh to the gate of the city, behold, there was a dead man carried out, the only son of his mother, and she was a widow, and much people of the city was with her. Look at this from a perspective, not as an American reading this about a Jewish person. Put yourself in the life, in the experience, in the situation of this woman. Okay? She had a husband who died. She was a widow. Amen? There's no government assistance at this time under the Roman government for that, right? There's none. No, there's no assistance for people who can't work and find jobs and no assistance for women who don't have somebody to support them, right? But she had one hope. She already suffered because she lost her husband, right? But at least she had her old son. Her son would take care of her, right? At least he could grow up and hold a job and take care of her and bring some kind of income into the house, and, and that's what happened. See, people didn't go on welfare. They went to their family. Yes. Well, I, I wish we could go back to that. Now everybody relies on the government, and we're dividing our families up. Right? You know what happened when... The in-laws got too old to take care of themselves. They didn't go off to the nursing home. They moved in with their children. Amen? Don't get any ideas, Mark. <laughs> I'd love for my in-laws to, I mean this in all seriousness, I'd love for my in-laws to live with us. They probably wouldn't like it much, but, <laughs> but I'd love for them to live with us. See, but that's the way they did things back then. So she's got... She's suffering because of the loss of her husband. But what happens? She's got one hope left. Her son. And what happens? He dies. This lady's in a bad way. She's not only suffering emotionally because of the loss of her husband, emotionally because of the loss of her son, but she's suffering financially. She's suffering with food and needs and all kinds of felt needs that are out there. Listen to me. She's suffering. Jesus Christ sees this situation and he says, oh, no, no, no. No, no, we can't have that. Right? He saw her. And what does the Bible say? had compassion on this woman. Amen? Compassion on this woman. Verse number 13, And when the Lord saw her, He had compassion on her, and said unto her, Weep not. Let, let me explain to you something, that the tears that she was weeping were not only emotional tears for the loss of her husband, and not only emotional tears for the loss of her son, but you know what I think? I think there were a few tears in here that were, that were tears of, what am I going to do for food? Amen. What am I going to do for a place to live? What am I going to do to stay out of the gutter? Hmm? Amen. Verse 14, And he came and touched the beer. The beer is the... Uh, the uh, the thing in which the body is carried on. And they that bear him stood still. And he said, young man, I say unto thee, arise. And he that was dead sat up and began to speak, and he delivered him to his mother. That's compassion. That's compassion to the scattered that's compassion to the sick. That's compassion to the suffering. I don't know if I could picture a situation any worse suffering than what this woman was going through before her son was brought back to life. 
And today we're trained to say, well, you know, go see the unemployment line. Eh? Go see the government. Go here for assistance. Go there for assistance. Instead, we're being disconnected from our compassion. Amen. Even the churches being disconnected from our compassion. Compassion should be contagious. Jesus Christ has shown us compassion in his essence and in his experience. We have all experienced the compassion of Jesus Christ, have we not? Yes. We ought to show it. It ought to be catchy. It ought to be contagious. We ought to pass it along to others. But here's the last one, or the second to last one, the one we might not like. To the sinning. Right? To the sinning. Look at, look at Mark for a moment here. I, I want to point something out to you. Mark, chapter 14. Look at verse number 72. We're going to jump in right into the middle of a story, but I think you'll understand where we're at here. And the second time the cock crew, Peter called to mind the word that Jesus said unto him before the cock crew twice. Thou shalt deny me thrice. And when he thought thereon, he wept. Jesus Christ told Peter, before that cock crows two times, you're going to deny me three times. What did Peter do? Just exactly as the Lord had predicted. He gets around the fire. Hey, you're the guy who was around Jesus. No, I wasn't. A little girl comes up to him. Hey, you're the guy who was following with Jesus, weren't you? No, it wasn't me. Goes over to another group of people. Hey, you talk like one of those guys following Jesus. I am not a follower of Jesus. Three times he denies him. Right? Turned his back on Jesus Christ. How did Jesus Christ respond to this? Look at Mark chapter 16 and verse number 7. This is amazing to me. Because I don't know why God does it this way. If I were God, I wouldn't do it this way. Right? Jesus Christ is risen from the dead. Right? Look what it says in verse number seven. First, the first, first thing out of Jesus' mouth. But go your way. Tell his disciples and Peter that he goeth before you into Galilee, and there shall ye see him as he said unto you. Jesus Christ tells the angels, deliver this message to the disciples. Right? The, the, the angels deliver the message to the disciples, but I want you to notice just a subtlety in this verse. But go your way and tell the disciples, and what? Peter. Why? Why did he say, and Peter? You know why I think he said, and Peter? Because if he just said disciples, and Peter heard that message, Peter would probably think, well, I'm not his disciple. I denied him. He's not talking to me. But Jesus Christ wanted Peter to know, I know that you denied me, but I have compassion on you. Amen? Amen. Peter wept. He had a need. His need was to be forgiven. Amen? Amen. That's what his need was. He denied the Lord three times. He realizes what he did, and he instantly goes to tears, the Bible says, because he had a need to be forgiven. And Jesus Christ is there to inwardly respond to that need. And Jesus Christ says, hey, go tell the disciples and Peter to meet me down in Galilee. Now, look, I don't know about you, but if I left town for a while and I caught wind that, you know, somebody was talking bad about me behind in my back and three times somebody asked them if they were a friend of mine and they totally denied being my friend, I'd come back looking for them. But 
but not the way Jesus Christ came back looking for him. Right? Jesus Christ came back and said, I know you've made some mistakes. I, I know you've done wrong. I know that you're a sinner. But I still want you with me. I still want you with me. Isn't that amazing? Not only does he focus his compassion on the scattered, the sick, and the suffering, and the sinning. And don't ever forget that. Sin is a bad, horrible, awful thing. And there's consequences to sin, and the wages of sin is death. Yes, that's all absolutely true. But do not ever believe the lie that says just because you found yourself in sin, and just because you're struggling with something, that the compassion of Jesus Christ is not focused on you. The seeking. Mark chapter 10, look at verse number 17. And when he was gone forth into the way, there came one running and kneeled to him and asked him, Good master, what shall I do that I may inherit eternal life? This guy is seeking. Amen? Amen. And Jesus said unto him, Why callest thou me good? There is none good but one, that is God. Thou knowest the commandments, do not commit adultery, do not kill, do not steal, do not bear false witness, defraud not, honor thy father and, the, and mother. And he answered and said unto him, Master, all these have I observed from my youth. Then Jesus, beholding him, loved him and said unto him, what? Look, you have to understand this word beholding in the word of God. I've explained it before, but it's the difference of where your heart is at. Amen? The Bible says that, that Judas stood afar off and watched what was going on with Christ. Right? But the Bible also says that Mary stood afar off watching what was going on with Christ. You know what the only difference is? The word beholding is used to describe where Mary's standing. She stood beholding Christ afar off. You know what that means? It means physically she was here, but her heart and emotionally and spiritually she was right next to Christ. You see that? It's a powerful word in this Bible. This says that Jesus Christ did what? Beholding him, loved him. Amen? This man came to him and was seeking. And let me explain to you this morning. That when somebody is seeking Christ, you be careful to show them compassion. And don't chase them off because their hair isn't right, or their dress is not right, or they've got an earring where you're not supposed to put earrings. Amen? Amen? or they don't talk like you, or they don't walk like you, or they're struggling with some things, or they're into this, or they're into that. Let me tell you something. You be careful to show somebody who's seeking compassion. Because I've seen many a stupid Christians run off people who were seeking because they lacked compassion. There's a story that Stephen Covey tells in one of his books. It's a personal experience that he had on a subway in New York City one day. He walked into the subway and he sat down. The train moved to the next stop, stopped, and gentleman stepped on the train and had two young kids with him. 
The man sat down in the chair on the subway, closed his eyes, and was oblivious to what the kids were doing. Meanwhile, the kids were wreaking havoc on the rest of the subway, running around, tearing around, right? Standing on the chairs, swinging off the bars, and the man still completely oblivious to what his kids were doing. Stephen Covey's own personal experience, he tells the story that he walks over to the man and says, uh, Sir, while well, everybody else is saying, what is, what is with these kids? Get these kids, can't this guy get these kids under control? Why doesn't he spank them? Why doesn't he chain them down? Why doesn't he duct tape them to the seats? Whatever he's got to do. How come his kids are so horrible and awful? And why isn't he doing anything about it? Stephen Covey, along with the frustration of the rest of the people on the train, stands up, walks over to the man and says, uh, Sir, and he opens his eyes and looks around, Again, oblivious to what's going on, he says, Sir, could you, could you keep an eye on your kids and watch them a little better? You know what the man's response was? He says, you know, I'm really sorry. I just, uh, I'm exhausted. He said, we just came from the hospital where an hour ago my wife and their mom passed away. And he says, I just don't know what to do. Now, sometimes compassion is not seeing what you see on the surface. Amen? But sometimes compassion starts when we begin to understand the hurt of other people. Right? Stop looking at the surface. Didn't the disciples teach us that? Lord, when are we going to have our kingdom? Who's going to be the highest in the kingdom? When are you going to enter in your kingdom? When are we going to get rid of these Romans? Surface. Right? Stop looking at the surface. Stop looking at the way things appear realize that people are hurting and our compassion needs to be extended to them while they're hurting let me ask you this question what do you see do you see the surface or do you see or try to see what's going on underneath the surface amen why is his compassion expressed let's move through this quickly I think number one his compassion is expressed for one of two reasons. Instruction. Look, look at Luke chapter 9 with me. Luke chapter 9, as we move through this. Luke chapter 9 gives us one of the reasons why his compassion is expressed. Luke chapter 9 and verse number 54, it says this. And when his disciples, James and John, saw this, they said, Lord, wilt thou that we command fire to come down from heaven and consume them, even as Elias did? <laughs> you have no idea what, what I'm doing here, do you? Look at Mark 6 and look at verse 34. And Jesus, when he came out, saw much people and was moved with compassion toward them because they were as sheep not having a shepherd and began to teach them many things. And when the day was now far spent, his disciples came unto him and said, This is a desert place, and now the time is far past. Send them away that they may go into the country round about and into the villages and buy themselves bread. They have nothing to eat. <laughs> Why did he express his compassion? Because you and I, naturally know nothing about compassion. <laughs> Amen? 
Lord, why don't you just send fire down from heaven and burn them all up? You let Elias do it, let us do it. Lord, I know we're in this desert place. Why don't you send these people away? Let them go buy for themselves food back in the villages. Jesus Christ says, oh, I got a better plan. They're hungry. If we can feed them. He showed his compassion. Why? For instructional purposes. Because without him, you and I know nothing about compassion. You and I are like the disciples. Send fire down and burn them up. That would be cool. Cool for the ones not being burned. Have them walk back out of this desert place. They can buy their own food. That's not compassion. Jesus Christ looks upon them and says they've been walking all day. We're going to have them walk all the way back so they can buy their own food. Why don't we just feed them right here? And I'll feed them for free. And I'll show them a miracle. And I'll make them famous and put them in the Bible. <laughs> as one of the 3,000 and one of the 5,000. Right? That's compassion. to show us compassion and what it is and what it looks like. That's why he expressed his compassion. But why else? Involvement. Follow with me. We're almost done. Look at Matthew chapter 7 and verse number 12. Now you all ought to know this because this is the golden rule. Okay? Right? Matthew 7, 12 is the golden rule. Remember that. How many of you knew that Matthew 7, 12 was the golden rule before I just said it? Not too many. Well, then you just proved to me that we need more involvement. Let's read it here for a minute. You ready? Therefore, all things whatsoever ye would that men should do to you, do ye even so to them, for this is the law and the prophets. Amen? Well, let me explain something to you. The golden rule was around, or variations of it were around, long before Jesus ever spoke the words. Were you aware of that? The Hindus taught a variation of the golden rule. The Jews taught a variation of the golden rule. The Zoroastrian religion taught a form of the golden rule. The Greek philosophers taught a form of the golden rule. Let me, let me read for you their version of the golden rule. You ready? In the Hindu faith, their golden rule is this. This is the sum of duty. Do not to others, which if done to thee, would cause thee pain. Fairly close. L listen to the, to the Jewish golden rule. What is hateful to you, do not to your fellow men. That is the entire law. All the rest is commentary. These are actual other religions version of the golden rule. Okay? The Zoroastrian faith, their version of it is, whatever is disagreeable to yourself, do not do unto others. The Buddhist faith is this, hurt not others with that which pains yourself. The Greek philosopher uh, Socrates said, said it this way, do not do unto others what angers you if done to you by others. And many people say, well, see, there it is. The golden rule isn't exclusive to the Bible. It's not exclusive to Jesus. All these other religions that were around long before Jesus ever came had a variation of the golden rule. But let me point out to you one subtle difference that you probably didn't catch. 
that does, in fact, make the golden rule very exclusive to the Christian faith. You ready? Every one of the variations of the golden rule that I read to you, from the Hindus to the Jews to Socrates to the Buddhists to the Zoroastrians, they were negative. The commandment was negative. Basically, it is this. Withhold doing wrong from others. Right? Withhold doing wrong from others. Don't do something wrong to somebody that you wouldn't want done to you. If it hurts you, it's going to hurt somebody else. That is the overriding theme among all of the other variations of the golden rule. But let me read for you once again the golden rule out of Matthew 7, 12. And listen and follow closely. Therefore all things whatsoever ye would that men should do to you, do even so to them. For this is the law and the prophets. You know what Jesus Christ is saying? Jesus Christ is not saying, don't do something that hurts other people because it hurts you. He's saying the things that you would like done to you, do those things to other people. Listen, abstaining from poor behavior is not getting involved. Amen? Just because you abstain from doing something bad to somebody else does not mean that you're getting involved with their life, with their problems, with their trials, with their situation. Jesus Christ is saying, get involved. Amen. Right? Amen. Do to others the things that you would like done unto yourself. Such a subtle difference, but yet it changes the entire thing, doesn't it? It's very, very interesting. There was a man, two boys, high school boys, I think they were about in ninth grade, and they were walking home from school. One was ahead of the other one a little bit, and um, the one behind the, the other one saw him struggling to carry his books, and he had a baseball bats, and he had baseball gloves, and football helmets, and books, and all, I mean, just carrying tons of stuff. And he ended up being so overloaded with the stuff he was carrying that he fell down and spilled it all over the sidewalk. And the, the young man who was behind him saw this happen, and so he rushes up to him and kneels down and helps him pick stuff up, and and says, hey, you know, I'll help you. I'll help you carry it. Where do you live? Let's we'll walk to your house. I'm walking home. You can't live that far. And so he picks up half the load, and the other kid picks up half the load, and they both, you know, go over to his house and sit around for a while and talk. He says, hey, you want a Coke? And so they're sitting around, they have a Coke, and they get to know each other a little bit. Not, not the best of friends or anything like that, but they spend some time together after he helped him carry all of his stuff home. And about three or four years later, Graduation day comes, and they really hadn't talked to each other other than just that one day, uh, all the way until graduation. All of a sudden, the one young man who dropped all his stuff on the sidewalk and had this big burden load to carry comes up to the other young man and says, says, do you remember that day four years ago that you helped me pick up all my stuff? And he says, yeah, I remember that. We went over to your house and we had some Cokes and got to know each other a little bit. Sorry, I haven't, we've been out of touch since then. But he says, I, I got to tell you something. He said, that day, you don't know what was going on in my life. But he said, I had cleaned out my locker at school. And this is a true story. He said, I had cleaned out my locker at school because I was going home to commit suicide. And he said to the young man who helped him on graduation day, he said, you don't know this, but when you picked up my books 
and my baseball bat and my baseball glove and my football helmet. He said, when you helped me pick up my stuff, he said, you saved my life. Go to Jude chapter 1 and look at verse 22. And I want you to look at this and read with me carefully. And he says, and of some have compassion, making a difference. Amen? Amen. Jude says that those who have compassion make a difference. Tell you what, for that young guy who was going to go home and kill himself, compassion sure made a difference, didn't it? When Jesus Christ had compassion on the scattered, boy, it sure made a difference. When he had compassion on the sick, it sure made a difference. When he had compassion on the seeking, sure made a difference. When he had compassion on the sinning, sure made a difference, didn't it? Our whole calendars changed when Jesus Christ had compassion on sinners. The way we keep time and track of years changed. Right? When Jesus Christ had compassion, I'll tell you something. It is those who have compassion that make a difference. Jesus Christ showed compassion when he died on the cross of Calvary. Is his compassion contagious through you? Do you show his compassion to others through your life? Those who might be seeking, or would you prefer to scare them off? Because that certainly is more spiritually effective, isn't it? Hmm? Compassion makes a difference. Have you received the compassion that Jesus Christ showed so many years ago on the cross of Calvary? Have you received that into your own life? Amen? When he died on the cross, he showed his love for you. And the Bible says, greater love hath no man than this, than he lay down his life for his friends. Jesus Christ laid down his life for you. There is no greater love than that. He had compassion on you, and he has compassion on you today. Amen? Amen. Take the compassion of Jesus Christ. Utilize it in your own life to receive the work that he did for you on the cross of Calvary as he suffered and died and bled for your sins. Receive that gift that he's offering to you. Then as that compassion has been shown to you, it is supposed to be a contagious compassion that you then pass on to other people. And Jesus Christ is glorified whether people see compassion from him directly or whether they see his compassion through you. Let's pray.